Paul says, I forget what is behind. One thing I do, I forget what is behind me. If you don't forget, you never create more memories. You know, every one of us in this room and those of you watching this program, you got to remember that you are simply the sum total of the choices you make every day. That's all you are. That means whatever you decide, that's what you become. And if you keep making the same decisions that you made 20 years ago, then you maintain what you were made 20 years ago. Therefore, if you decide to do something different, you become different based on what you decide. You know, I was thinking, if decisions are the sum total of your life, then the quality of your decision determines the quality of your life. So if you make bad decisions, you have a bad life. You make good decisions, you have a good life. Is that simple enough? Sure. And so we find some principles in the Bible that help us with this. God told the children of Israel one time, he says, I've said before you blessing and curses, life and death. Then he says, choose you this day what you will do. In other words, whatever happens to you is your choice. But I like the advice that God gives in that verse in Deuteronomy 30. He says, choose life. In other words, I can't choose for you, but you can choose what I advise you to do, and that is to choose life. God is a good God. He knows what's good for you, and he advises you to choose it. Now, everything that you remember right now, you decided to get involved in. Your memory is your decisions. Your memories are your decisions right now. I've discovered that if you don't like what you remember, create a new memory. And you create a new memory by making new decisions that create a new past. And also, you can decide that you're going to allow your decisions for the next 20 years to be so good that your old decisions will be drowned out by your new ones. In other words, if your good past outweighs your bad past, then you'll remember the good. That's what Paul was saying. I forget what is behind me, and then I do what? I press or strain toward what is ahead. I press. Everybody say press. press. Say it again, press. press. Now, the, this particular statement was, was written in Greek. And the word for press in the Greek actually means to lean. It's, a, it's an amazing concept. It means to actually lean into something. Paul says, I forget what's behind and I am leaning into what's ahead. Which means that you got to put a little pressure on life to move towards your future. There's also a concept that your past is pulling you back, so you got to press yourself away from it in order for you to move to your future. Your future is waiting for you, but you got to press toward it. Press also means that there is a resistance against moving towards your future. Whenever you decide to become what you were born to be, suddenly you realize who your enemies are. As a matter of fact, if you don't want to be successful, don't do nothing. If you want to be successful, begin to move away from your past and you'll realize that people and situations really are not in your favor. Have you noticed? People who ain't going nowhere want you to go with them. And people who ain't doing nothing want you to do it with them. The minute you start to do something with your life is when everybody who you thought was your friend begins to turn against you. When you start to dream big, the small dreamers wake up. Paul says you got to press your way into life. You got to actually put pressure to advance. That means you don't wait for things to break for you in life. Some folks waiting for the big break, mm -mm, you got to break it yourself. Some folks waiting for opportunity to find them, mm -mm, you got to create your own. As a matter of fact, if you do not begin to walk, you'll never move. Paul says, I press toward what is ahead. 
I press onward to the goal to win the prize for which God has called me toward Christ. There's a statement Paul makes in this same chapter. He says, I want to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. That's something to really consider for a while. He says, I press to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. That means Paul knew that Christ took hold of him so he could take hold of something. That means Paul knew he was created to actually accomplish something and that's why Christ apprehended him so he could accomplish what he was created to accomplish. Uh, he also wrote in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, he says that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Now here's the way most people read that who are religious. They say, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to go to heaven. Most people are in religion so they can leave earth. Most people come to the church and get religion so they can go to heaven. But the Bible actually teaches the opposite. The Bible says God literally saved you and redeemed you and changed you and gave you his spirit so that he could get you to do the works that he prepared for you before the world began. Which means that you were born to complete an assignment, but before you could complete it, something went wrong with you. It's called the fall. But the works were still waiting for you to do. And so God made arrangements to bring you back in sync with the work, and that's called salvation. When you're saved, you are saved to do the works that were prepared for you before the world began. Which means that you were born again to do something, not to go somewhere. I'll fly away. You ever heard about that? Folks want to leave the earth. No. God wants you to stay here because there's something for you to do. You know what's so boring? Waiting to go to heaven. That's why you're bored. That's why people who are, who are in church are the most miserable people in the world. Because they're sitting there for 20 years in a pew waiting to leave. Brother, if you're going to go somewhere, just leave. No, God created you and I to accomplish something. That's why the final judgment statement should be, well done. Not well waited. Yeah? Not well said, but well what? Done. That means you got to do something with your life. That is why the church itself has become such a boring place. Because we tell people, now that you are saved, born again, regenerated, whatever the words you want to use, we say, now just sit tight, give your tithes, and attend church every week, and then when Christ comes, he'll rapture you. You know, we don't need a rapture, we need a rupture. God needs to rupture our laziness. He needs to rupture our dull thinking. He needs to rupture our do-nothingness. God needs to come in and shake you up. That's why he sent me here. I have come to make you uncomfortable. I have come to literally make you sick of doing nothing. I hope when you get away from this place, you'll be mad. I want you to get so mad because you don't do nothing until you're mad. You got to be angry enough to change. And that is why Paul says, I want to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. Now, that has to do with what you were born to do. And when Christ took hold of you, he had that in mind. Not heaven in mind, but that. That what? That thing that you were born to accomplish. So your birth was, a, was given to the planet for you to do something, and God doesn't want you to come to heaven without it being accomplished. Now, what did Paul have to forget? Good question. Paul had to forget the memories of murder. As a matter of fact, it was Paul who was responsible for the death of Stephen. Paul gave the signal. He dropped his cloak and they began to stone. I can imagine Paul thinking, Stephen might have written one of the Gospels. I killed a man who probably had some books inside. Paul may have had to remember the that the leaders that he killed, who were supposed to have also written epistles, but he terminated their lives. Paul had some memories that, that I mean, could you imagine this man living with being responsible for killing people? I mean, you could think 
if he was in this city right now and he was a murderer, we'd write him off as a, as a, as a hopeless case. As a matter of fact, the prison is filled with authors. The jails are jam-packed with great leaders. I think about people like Moses. Murders, Moses was a murderer. And we forget who Moses was. That means the next time you read the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you're reading the writings of a murderer. <laughs> God gave the most awesome revelation to two men, Moses and Paul. And both were murderers. Thank God for forgetting. God doesn't hold our past against us because our future is too important to God. No one knows a product like the manufacturer. If you are going to move from who you now are to, whom God created you to be, you too must seek to understand the nature of God's original design for you before sin ravaged your life. That understanding is not available to you unless you become reconnected with God, your creator. Apart from him, you cannot and will not release your full potential because he gave you this potential and he designed you to fulfill it. You must know God, your source, if you want to experience a satisfying, abundant life. What a change! Few of us will experience a change as dramatic as that which occurred in the man. Saul who became Paul, but a change just as radical from being self-centered to God-centered, must occur in all who would discover and use their full potential. This is true because the foundation key for releasing potential is always a relationship with the source or maker of a product. You must have a life-changing encounter with the one who made you if you want to become who you were created to be. I imagine when God went to Moses and told Moses what he must do, Moses' memories began to fight God's will. Moses' most important question to God for his personal problem was, who am I that I should go? That's a very important. He was dealing with a self-concept issue. He was saying, God, do you know who I am? I am a killer. I am a fugitive. And you're sending me back to the very city that has posters all over the city. Want it? Mo. I mean, I can't go back there. I'm a killer. I'm a fugitive. I'm on the run. And you're sending me back to do something that is so awesome. Do you know who I am? You know, many of you in this room and also watching this program, you felt the same way. You know, I've discovered something that God doesn't care what you've done if you're willing to do what he wants you to do. Matter of fact, you are more concerned about what you've done than God is. Who cares if you're divorced? Divorce is an event. Go on and live. Who cares if you had a, an abortion? An abortion is a tragedy, but it's an event. It occurred. Now get on and live. An abortion is murder, isn't it? So is killing a man and burying him in the sand. Moses committed abortion. He killed a man who didn't finish living his life. Paul was an abortionist. He killed people who didn't finish living their lives. And yet, what happened after the abortion of those people? God gave Moses the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. You see, it's after your tragedy that God does the greatest work. That's why if you fail, it's because you decided not to succeed. If you lose, it's because you decided not to win. You must be like Paul forget what's behind now I don't believe anything lives with us more than our past it is always there it haunts us if we let it it's like a shadow that's always ready to punks upon our future to many of us our past is a constant threat to the dreams in our hearts many spend time visiting their past and they have no time to go into their future most people live in their past and they never enter their future. Others allow their past to hold them back so they can't go toward their future. And then there are those who just 
live their past, constantly reliving what they did. How sad. How are we as individuals supposed to deal and look at our past? How are we supposed to do that? How do we let our past go forever? This session we're dealing with is the key to living your future. And the key to living your future is letting go of your past. If you don't let your past go, you'll never live your future. There are many of our past that control our present and it actually imprisons our future. We are locked by what we... The mode of operation for maximum performance of any product is determined and established by the manufacturer or creator and must be obeyed for maximum benefit. Thus, the second key to releasing. Your potential is knowing how God created you to function and applying that knowledge to your life. No builder can successfully restore a house unless he first knows the specifications determined by the builder and the features provided by the original blueprints. A shower, for example, may fulfill part of the designer's intent for the bathroom, but it cannot match all the functions of a tub. Thus, installing. A shower in place of a tub would change not only the room's appearance, but also its ability to provide the intended functions that were built into the original design. Man was designed to live by faith. God's original design for men and women calls for them too. Live from the perspective of faith with eternity in their hearts. The book of Hebrews defines faith as being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see Hebrews 11 to 1. This is God's mode of operation. He is not influenced by outward appearances. Neither is his power diminished by seemingly impossible obstacles. God is not influenced by outward appearances. Neither is his power diminished by seemingly impossible obstacles. The Apostle Paul learned the importance of looking beyond what is immediately visible and evident. Although he encountered many situations that seemed to stand in the way of his mission too. Share the good news of Jesus with those outside the Jewish world. He persevered by focusing on his God-given task and by relying on the Holy Spirit to guarantee the completion of God's plans. Thus, Paul testified, I live by faith, not by sight, to Corinthians 5 to 7. 